I'm John Sargent and welcome to Argumental, the show where the hottest names in comedy debate the biggest issues facing mankind. Is air travel viable? Do we need a DNA database? And can I claim for Busty Babes 12 on my expenses? <laughs> Here to argue such burning issues and others like them are our teams. With Marcus Brigstock in the red corner, please welcome Sean Locke. <laughs> And joining Rufus Hound on the blue team, please welcome Phil Jupiter. <laughs> OK, let's kick off with round one, where we discuss an important issue that's had us all reacting one way or another. Tonight, the subject is this. Nuclear energy, that sea-warming, teeth-melting, fish-mutating power source. Cleaner than coal and cheaper than gas, it's hotter than the seats of a Greek hire car. <laughs> it's the scourge of the Greens and Sellafield estate agents, and lasts even longer than a tantric romp with Sting. <laughs> but the issue I want the teams to argue over is this. Nuclear power is the fuel of the future. Up first, and supporting the statement, it's Phil Jupiter. Nuclear power is just like Justin Timberlake. It's clean, it's efficient, but at the same time, you're always a bit curious about it. <laughs> and like Timberlake, if you put it next to a 50-year-old boiler, it looks fantastic. <laughs> now, uh, up behind me there, you can see what the old nuclear doom merchants call a mushroom cloud. Ooh! <laughs> Ooh! Scary! Well, news for you there, guys. I love mushrooms. <laughs> <laughs> and over my shoulder, that thing wouldn't be scary if we called it, I don't know, an energy tree. <laughs> or the big, friendly, toasty warmth cloud. See? It's a matter of, it's a matter of perception. <laughs> oh, yes. Marcus Brigstock is a man who will be up here in a moment who wants to stop the clock on progress. In fact, he wants to turn it back to a time when our skies were black with smog, our lungs choked with soot from burning coal ripped from the earth by miners owned by his family. <laughs> coal that would power the huge looms of his family's extensive mills. Looms that would kill more Victorian orphans than any nuclear disaster ever did. Barefoot paupers hunched over spinning jennies, slaving away so the mill owner could buy another gold-plated carriage for his son. These are the times that Marcus Bridgestock wants to turn back to. The good old days as he knows them. <laughs> oh, he's going to try and confuse you with a lot of talk about nuclear mutation around the outspill pipes of power stations. <laughs> <laughs> the crabs have got three claws. Fish with no tails. Sterile wildlife. <laughs> but wouldn't you want to be able to silence that with your third eye? <laughs> or one great big ear? How about a 20-foot prehensile penis that screams when you touch it? <laughs> Me, that's what makes nuclear the fun energy. It's the power source for people with balls. Balls on their chin. <laughs> Vote blue. Yes. <laughs> okay, next up, opposing Phil and nuclear power for the Reds. It's Marcus Brigstock. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, we shouldn't embrace nuclear power. Of course, we shouldn't. The main reason for this is that most people can't even say it. When news reporters report on nuclear power, they pronounce it nuclear. <laughs> it's one of those words. If you can't say it, don't use it, like Draclia and Chimbley. <laughs> Listen, nuclear power is the fuel of the future. This is nonsense. It's the fuel of the past. It's the history. It's like saying Peter Stringfellow's the future of British sex. <laughs> oh, Christ. <laughs> oh, sorry, my mouth filled with sick. Listen, it's not the future. And who knows what the fuel of the future will be? Who knows if we'll even need fuel? If global warming continues, you'll be able to shove a chicken out through your letterbox and it will cook itself in three or four minutes. <laughs> Exciting times. We don't need a new wave of nuclear power stations in this country because you know who will provide them for us? The French. <laughs> Do you want nuclear energy in this country provided by the French? Think about it. Have you driven a Renault? <laughs> Imagine if something went wrong. There was a massive explosion. The, the, the reactor started to melt down. You went, what do we do? Je ne sais pas, c'est déjeuner maintenant. 
te jure, j'ai euh, pris euh, deux heures pour un euh, big lunch. J'adore le fromage. <rire> There is a meltdown now? Bon, fondu. <rire> the fuel of the future, ladies and gentlemen, is surely, we all understand now, the sunshine that comes out of President Obama's ass that can be used <laughs> to heat the bullshit that comes out of Gordon Brown's mouth. That, <laughs> my friends, is the future. Please, vote with the red team. Thank you, Marcus. Sean and Rufus, would you like to join the debate? It's obviously not the fuel of the future. Everyone knows what the fuel of the future is. And it's... We've got in virtually... Every large city in this country has got one. It's a zoo. <laughs> There's loads of animals in the zoo doing bugger all all day long, <laughs> lying around, licking their ghoulies, waiting to be fed. What do they like better than a treadmill? A little wheel. <laughs> you put a centipede on a treadmill, 100 legs. Jesus Christ. <laughs> Can you get your head round that? <laughs> one, one wanking monkey could pair a DVD player for a week. Yes. <laughs> uh, nuclear power is the fuel of the future, but uh, fission isn't. Uh, fusion is. Cold fusion is genuinely the fuel of the future, borne out by the fact that we currently can't do it yet, but the math supports that it is possible. The amount of electricity we're able to generate, uh, even if we invested double the amount that we invest in fusion in renewable energy sources, just doesn't add up. That literally, unless Sorry, we what? all... It doesn't add up. What doesn't? The... If you take the investment <laughs> in renewable energy resources... What's this? Equivalent... What's this become? Newsnight? <laughs> Your, your assumption, Hound, that the numbers don't add up in terms of renewable energy investment. sources is simply not true. There isn't currently the right level of investment for renewable energy sources. Yeah, but in either. But, yeah. right, in nuclear power, to renew nuclear power in this country will cost billions yeah. of pounds. It is massively irresponsible. It'd be like putting Fred Goodwin in charge of everything. <laughs> I the completely is, and numbers, totally agree with what Marcus said. Numbers always add up. Yeah. Think so about does that. Carol Vorderman. <laughs> numbers always, you put them together, they add up. <laughs> oh, All right. I'm going to get a little sleep now, Marcus. <laughs> you sort out the rest of the show, I'm feeling kind Sean. of sleepy. Sean. <laughs> Sean. <laughs> Sean. <laughs> What's minus one plus minus three? I don't know, sounds like a lousy lunch. <laughs> I ain't ordering it. <laughs> I don't know why I'm putting on an American accent. <laughs> I think we made our case, Marcus. <laughs> no, you haven't. I completely agree with you that if you take um, fission as the fuel of the future, it's a hideous waste of uh, resources and hope, as it goes. But if you invest uh, the equal amount in fusion, there is a genuinely renewable energy resource available to us. Or you put pants on a chimp. You put him in a wheel, you put eels down the pants. <laughs> Forget it! <laughs> OK, thank you all. So, is nuclear power the fuel of the future? It's time for our studio audience to decide who made the best case. Hold up your red cards if you agree with Marcus and Sean, and the blue ones for Rufus and Phil. Vote now. Once you put monkeys in a punchline, <laughs> it is all over. <laughs> so, a clear victory for the red team. Well done, Marcus and Sean. <laughs> Faced with the enormous cost of nuclear power, perhaps we should return to the traditional British ways of keeping warm, burning coal, wood and Catholics. <laughs> Right, next up is Slideshow, where the teams illustrate their argument using a series of pictures which they've never seen before. Rufus, I'd like you to start us off by arguing that bees are better than wasps. And here's your first picture. This is the easiest argument in the world. There is no way wasps are better than bees. So, what we've learned from that is that bees are better than wasps. <laughs> Who here likes the BBC? Right, how fond of it would you be if it was called the Wasp Wasp Sea? <laughs> you wouldn't. You'd hate it. <laughs> Bees are a national treasure. Uh, and <laughs> national treasures should stick together, as the old poem goes. <laughs> <laughs> Bees 
bees, what do we get from bees earn their keep, don't they? A bit of honey from a bee, you think, oh, that's, you know, you've earned your place in this. What do you get from a wasp? Nothing. <laughs> As this next picture demonstrates... <laughs> bees make me want to jump for joy, ladies and gentlemen, <laughs> uh, and, and reach for the sky. Who here doesn't want to dance around, uh, <laughs> much like the bee does. They find a bit of nectar, they come back, they say to the other bees, hey, guys, follow me. And the bees say, to where? And the bee just goes, just follow me. <laughs> what a civilised way of giving directions, ladies and gentlemen, the dance. <laughs> if you're watching at home, this is how you get to my house. <laughs> There are some animals that are just bastards, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> I can't help it, it's just the way we've all evolved. The ladybird, lovely. Wasp, bastard. <laughs> uh, bee, brilliant. That's why brilliant starts with a bee. Sharks, bastards. <laughs> the same goes for estate agents, just in case you're watching. <laughs> Although I appreciate I have rather copied your look. <laughs> Would you like to have a look around this house? Where is it? Because you can put down all the money you want to buy a house, ladies and gentlemen, it doesn't make you the winner. Ultimately, who likes bees? Yeah. Who thinks wasps are assholes? Yeah. Remember that, ladies and gentlemen, as you vote blue. I thank you. Thanks, Rufus. Next up, arguing that wasps are better than bees, it's Sean Locke, and here's your first picture. <laughs> bees are shit. God hates them, right? Because they do one sting, dead. Ha ha! <laughs> Wasps sting again, again, again. <laughs> do a light sting, a big sting, eight stings. Wasps have also, they're better than bees because bees have knees. Rubbish. Wasps, elbows. Ah. Oh. <laughs> How much better is a lovely crumpet, right, with a bit of butter on it and a wasp hovering <laughs> around it? And you think to yourself, doesn't that crumpet suddenly look much more delicious? <laughs> Do you want it more? When well, you know the wasp wants it too, and you're thinking, he's after my crumpet! Before, when there was no wasp, B comes by, you go, he's not interested in this, there's some flowers around the corner. <laughs> right? <laughs> oh, there's nothing better at Christmas morn <laughs> than to have seen your little infant child has turned into half a wasp. <laughs> Fear not, though. It is the old Christmas tradition of the wasping of the childs at Christmas. <laughs> it's to panic the mother so that she gets on with the dinner. <laughs> you, know that? you know what I hate about bees? Is they go all over the place, don't they? I mean, this is a bee getting from there, getting from A to B. <laughs> Christ, I can't believe how good I am. Um, <laughs> this is A, and they go B, right? This is a B going over there. They go like this. <laughs> Idiots. <laughs> Wasp. <laughs> Done. <laughs> well, they are. Wasps ultimately are better than bees. They're not nicer than bees, I accept, but they're better. They're more efficient. They're ruthless. They get the job done. <laughs> Bees, they just make us sticky. <laughs> Thanks, Sean. It's time to decide who made the best case. It's blue cards for Rufus and red ones for Sean. Vote now. <laughs> OK, and it's just a win for the Reds. Oh, well done, Sean. The wasp is the Naomi Campbell of the insect world. It's skinny and aggressive and often ends up all over the newspaper. <laughs> the bee, on the other hand, is like Elton John, a bloated queen who thrives on the sticky nectar of a pansy. <laughs> Join us after the break for more Argumental. Don't go away. Welcome back to Argumental, the show that promises more falling out than Kelly Brook in a low-cut frock. 
<laughs> the next round focuses on another major cultural issue. This great democracy of ours allows us the freedom to say what we like and do what we like. We can express our individuality in many ways, but none more time-honoured than this one. Please welcome Dodd. <laughs> Rufus and Sean, you're up for this one. Rufus, I'd like you to go first, and the topic I'd like you to argue is this. Skin was meant for tattooing. <laughs> no problem, John. <laughs> tattooing is an art form 5,000 years old. So intrinsic to humankind is the desire to mark and change our flesh that its appeal has lasted through five millennia. Now ask yourself, what else is there that you do that's lasted five millennia. In fact, don't answer that if you're married to Bruce Forsyth. <laughs> the problem seems to be that mostly we are all born looking the same. Two arms, two legs, one mouth, one nose, head, shoulders, knees and toes, knees and toes. <laughs> but on a planet with six billion inhabitants, how does one assert one's individuality? One's lack of conformity? This man has taken it to the extreme, but he looks glorious! <laughs> Who here's got a tattoo? You, sir, what have you got a tattoo of? A flaming skull. A flaming skull. Shazam! <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> look, a flaming skull. That's what he's got on his arm. But look at the actual man. <laughs> what is it you do, sir? I work in insurance. You work in insurance? <laughs> That's what tattoos are. You work in insurance, but you have a flaming skull. So while you're working on, um, you know, Excel, trying to add up columns, inside you're thinking, yeah but at the weekend, I'm going to rock out with my cock out. <laughs> have you got a tattoo, madam? What have you got? Um, I've got an Oscar Wilde quote. You, you've got an Oscar Wilde quote? <laughs> <laughs> we are all in the gutter, but some of us are looking up at the stars. Imagine that! Imagine not being able to remember that sentence. <laughs> Anybody else? Oh, up there, what have you got? One here. You've got one there that's in Irish? Greek. Greek? <laughs> and what does it mean? You and me. Does it mean that? Yeah. Are you Greek? No. So how do you know it means that? I did it on the internet. You did it on the internet. <laughs> how brilliant is that? I'm going to have something permanently marked on myself. Now, it's about time I checked a source about as reliable as Wikipedia. <laughs> Listen, a vote for Sean Locke and the red team is a mm. vote for being the same as everyone else. And do you want to know the things that everyone else likes? Westlife. <laughs> Noel Edmonds. <laughs> Eight out of ten cats. <laughs> it's not right. Be a human, be a canvas, and vote blue. I thank you. Thanks, Rufus. Up next, arguing that skin isn't meant for tattooing, it's the very brave Sean Locke. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. I mean, Rufus's argument centres on the idea that having a tattoo means you've got a bit of a personality. <laughs> you know, you're a bit of a character. <laughs> <laughs> and it's great. It's great to have a bit of a personality. If you want that personality to be, I'm a bit like an old school desk. <laughs> <laughs> I'll move over here a bit. <laughs> And, of course, tattooing can affect your job prospects. It's affected this man's. I'm a bank manager. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I, thought, I thought you looked like a midwife. <laughs> <laughs> Has anyone here not got a tattoo? Because Rufus said, anyone here not got a tattoo? What, what have you not got a tattoo of? <laughs> Can you show me? <laughs> wow, it's an arm! <laughs> well done! <laughs> I think there's two reasons I don't have a tattoo. The first reason was my granddad. You would faint. I'd faint. Well, I'd faint it would hurt me. Mm. You never know, I might like it. <laughs> you know, I might like that guy. I like wasps. <laughs> 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 
No, my granddad, I, was, I was kidding, when he was about 70, he rolled up his sleeve and he had his blotches on his arms and he said, don't get that done. He said, never get that done. I said, why, granddad? He said, because it hurts. But also, <laughs> he said, a lot of things that seem exotic and interesting when you're a young man change with time. And I said, what do you mean? He said, well, that one there. He said, when I was young, that was very exotic. And I said, what, a banana? <laughs> And he said, during the 40s, during rationing, bananas were a very rare thing. So I'd have been like, he had a, he had a real egg on that arm. <laughs> <laughs> Basically, his whole body was like homage to the rationing era. <laughs> on his back, he turned round, he had a full English roast dinner. Like <laughs> All the trimmings round there. <laughs> <laughs> he was a hell of a guy, hell of a guy. <laughs> The other reason I don't have a tattoo, and I don't think any of you want to have a tattoo, right, is because we all know there's no greater pe pleasure than being at home, right, taking all your clothes off, putting your big spoon in the honey pot, right, because <laughs> I do like it. I was lying over there. <laughs> and just dripping it on your body, all the honey, and it runs down. Oh, that's lovely, isn't it? Like that. And imagine if it went over an eagle's claw. Spoil it, wouldn't it? <laughs> Rufus has got tattoos, but you notice you can't see them. Do you know why? Because he's ashamed of them. Because if he had them, they'd be on his face. <laughs> and he'd have a spider's web, because he loves spiders. <laughs> that is why I think you should vote for the red team. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Sean, and a big round of applause for Dodd. Marcus and Phil, what do you reckon? Well, I was a bit surprised when I walked by Dodd. I think he was wearing Oscar de la Renta. Um, <laughs> he smelt lovely. <laughs> it's just, just low self-esteem, isn't it? It's just body dysmorphia. You oh, just you don't, loon, Yeah, it is. You just don't, feel, you don't feel OK about yourself, so you feel you have to pervert uh, the, the way that you look. Tattoos are beautiful things. They're, like, they're genuine art. You live with them. They can either be statements or you can use it as a roadmap of who you are and where you've been. You can wear moments of your life, like walking around with a permanent little photo album. It's beautiful. Having tattoos... Why not walk around with an actual photo album? <laughs> <laughs> well, because you then... change the pictures as your life evolves. Do you honestly think... And I, this, is, this will fascinate me, because I, I think I know exactly what you say. Do you honestly think in 20, 30, 40 years' time, assuming you haven't been murdered by then, that you will still think that the daubings you've put on your body now will be acceptable to you and interesting? I think what will happen is you'll wake up, you'll look in the mirror and you think, Christ, I was a tit. <laughs> and now I'm a wrinkly tit covered in crayon drawings that a child did. Yeah. <laughs> I think I know why Marx is getting his high horse. Uh, all on this thigh, I've got a big picture of Marx's wife. <laughs> <laughs> no, is it, is it true, though, Rufus? You can tell us, you know, honestly. I've got, I've got tattoos. Right, well, I've got a tattoo of my wife on that arm here. No, I'm not why going not? to take my shirt off. I'll you're tell ashamed. you. What. Not because I'm ashamed. Oh, right, this is how it works. Oh, oh. Basic playground <laughs> tattoos. The producers yes. have gone, oh, let's do a roundabout tattoos. John, get him to take his shirt off. <laughs> well, I will well, happily you show you my tattoos. Well, but I, think, you don't I don't like the style in which this is being Thank done. You. Show me your tattoo. <laughs> show me your tattoo. No. Tattoo. Rupert. <laughs> See, the thing is, Rufus, if you're a real man that could grow body hair like I do, you would carve interesting shapes into it. That's... <laughs> that, way, that way they don't stay for too long. Yeah. For well, example, I I, I've, I've had a, the image of your wife carved into my back, and because of her beard, it looks exactly like her. <laughs> exactly. It's, it's uncanny. I mean, a couple of people have said, is that Brian Blessed? And then they've looked closer and gone, <laughs> oh, no, that's Rufus's wife. <laughs> oh. You have to tattoo that. That's like when you put some raisins in a rice pudding to make it look better. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. <laughs> You've got a rice pudding in the That looks boring. I'll chuck a gun of raisins on it. <laughs> Rufus, talk us through this. Uh, and a, a brief description will do. That is monkeys fighting robots. <laughs> now, I grant you. 
It needs colouring in. Don't colour it in and then just give your kids felt pens at the weekend. <laughs> in these credit crunch times, Phil, how lovely to have a hobby. Yeah. <laughs> Batman, which I grant you isn't for everyone, by chuffing love, Batman. <laughs> <laughs> that is my wife. And then oh, finally... Oh, all right. Look at that! It's I'm the right. rubbishest of all the tattoos! <laughs> it's a sort of Disney dog doing stand-up comedy because I got it when I first started earning a living from doing stand-up. So... Have you got my... Alzheimer's? Is that the problem? <laughs> You don't know what your life looks like, <laughs> what job you do. Okay, thanks very much, thank you. Okay, that's it. It's up to our studio audience to decide who made the best case. Red for Sean and blue for Rufus. Vote now. <laughs> you see, it was worth it. It's a win for the blue team. Well done, Rufus. Time now for the final round and a last chance for our teams to demonstrate just how argumental they really are. I'm going to show them a series of images. All they have to do is suggest an argument to go with them. OK, here's your first one. <laughs> I think this is an argument against Yamaha's new range of lead drums. <laughs> this is an argument for following the instructions on someone's sleeve. <laughs> <laughs> this is an uh, argument for the opening scene of CSI Trumpton. <laughs> Next picture. <laughs> Thank God they tied him up because he's ready. <laughs> yeah, it's an argument against the new turnstiles at Anne Summers. <laughs> it's an argument against novelty diving boards. <laughs> And also, I think, probably an argument that I uh, really should stop being a model at those life-drawing <laughs> classes. What kind of hellish airport is that? <laughs> oh, welcome to Bangkok, I suppose. Yeah. <laughs> Next picture. <laughs> Monkeys can drive. <laughs> he hasn't got his eyes on the road, has he? He's, uh, is he looking in his wing mirror? I look fantastic. <laughs> is this uh, an argument that Bubbles misspent a lot of his settlement money from Michael Jackson? <laughs> I think that's an argument for uh, perhaps getting him a tie clip at Christmas. <laughs> he actually got one. Phil. He's actually got a tie clip in that tie. He's not clipped it to the shirt. Yeah. What a twat. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's an argument that George W. Bush is enjoying his retirement. <laughs> OK, that's it. So, for the final time, it's down to our studio audience to decide who made the best case. Red for Marcus and Sean, and blue for Rufus and Phil. Vote now. It's very close, but I think the red team have won the round, which means this week's winners are the red team. Well done, Marcus Brigstock and Sean Locke. Commiserations to Rufus Hound and Phil Jupitus. That's all we've got time for. Good night. <laughs> <laughs>